Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be looking at understanding the firm's short run cost curves. So both identifying the curves and also understanding their shape. All of the curves that I will look at are here. We have total costs, variable costs and fixed costs. On the bottom diagram we have marginal costs, average total costs, average variable costs and average fixed costs. And it's actually best to start with our total cost curve. We have a measure of quantity or output on the horizontal axes and costs on the vertical axes. So as we increase quantity, our costs always increase. They initially increase at a decreasing rate, so the slope of the curve gets flatter, and then they increase at an increasing rate, the slope gets steeper. I will discuss the slope in a second. Before that, however, I'm going to decompose our total costs, that's TC, into a fixed component, that's fixed costs, or FC, and variable costs, which is VC. So total cost is the sum of all the fixed costs and all of the variable costs. Now our fixed costs do not change as we change our quantity. They don't depend on how much we produce. That's why they're called fixed costs. As a consequence of this, they're costs that the firm incurs even if the firm does not produce anything. So even if our output, which is Q, is equal to zero. We can use these features to find and draw our fixed cost function. On our diagram, we can see that if the quantity is zero, our total cost is equal to the level of the vertical axis intercept. So if we produce nothing, we still have to pay this amount. And that's exactly what fixed costs is. As we increase our quantity, our fixed costs do not change. So the curve is just a straight horizontal line. It doesn't vary as we increase our level of output. Our variable costs are those costs that depend on how much we produce. They change as we change the quantity. When the quantity is zero, our variable cost will be zero too. So our variable cost curve will come straight out of the origin. We can figure out the rest of the shape by looking at our total cost curve. If our total cost curve is made up of our fixed cost and our variable costs, the fixed costs explain the level that the total costs start at and the variable cost will be identical to the shape of the total cost curve from that point. So variable cost actually looks like this. It's exactly the same as our total cost curve, but just shifted down by the amount of our fixed costs. Hopefully you can see, though my diagram isn't perfect, that you can get the total cost curve if you add our fixed costs to the variable costs. It's a good idea now to address the changing slope of this total cost curve. As I mentioned before, as we first start to increase our quantity, the slope of our total cost curve gets flatter. So total cost increases, but at a decreasing rate. To say another way, in this section of the curve, each additional unit that the firm produces becomes cheaper to produce. This behavior of our costs can be attributed to gains in efficiency due to specialization of our inputs. To give an example of how this works, Imagine that you own a pizza restaurant. Your output is the number of meals that you prepare and the inputs were going to be either labor or capital. So labor is our workers and capital is everything else. So all of the equipment, tables and chairs, etc. Initially, there's only one person working in the restaurant. Well, that person has a lot of tasks. They have to cook, clean and serve the customers. They're really multitasking. If I want to increase my quantity, that's the number of meals I provide, I'm going to hire someone else to help. But now we can divide those tasks up between the workers. This allows each worker to specialize in the tasks that they are most suited to. So economists might say that the tasks in which they have a comparative advantage. So one of our labor units can serve the customers because that's what they're better at. And the other person can cook and clean because that's what they're relatively better at. Just this possibility of specialization increases the efficiency of our labor units, which makes each marginal unit that we produce cheaper. When we look at our total costs, this comes through as a decrease in the rate in which our total cost increases. And so it's specialization that explains the shape of this part of the total cost curve here. 
Eventually, however, the slope does increase. This is due to the fact that we're in the short run. And recall that in the short run, at least one of our inputs to production is fixed. In fact, usually we talk about capital as being fixed and labor as being variable. If we go back to my example, capital would be the shop, the ovens, the chairs, etc. So if we want to increase our output, the only thing that I can add is more labor. So I can add more labor, but because the level of capital is fixed, this constrains the capacity of that additional labor to make and sell more meals. So for instance, maybe our workers will have to start lining up for the use of the oven or other equipment that they need to use. Whilst additional labor can make more meals, they are progressively less efficient at doing so because of these capacity constraints. What happens here is something we call diminishing marginal product. This leads it to being more and more expensive to make more output. And so it's diminishing marginal product as a result of the capacity constraints which we get in the short run that explains the shape of the total cost curve here. So we have initially specialization and then diminishing marginal product as the explanation for the changing slope of our total cost curve. By extension, this is also explaining the change in the slope of our variable cost curves. Understanding the slope of our total cost function is really going to help us understand our other curves. Let's think about marginal cost first. Now marginal cost is actually equal to the slope of the total cost curve. You can see this clearly if we note that marginal cost is equal to the change in total cost divided by the change in quantity or alternatively, the derivative of total cost with respect to Q. These ratios are the same as if we were looking for the slope of our total cost, which would be the ratio of rise over run. And rise over run is just going to track the change in our vertical axis variable, which is total costs, divided by the change in our horizontal axis variable, which is quantity. So we can see we have the same ratios here the slope of total costs is equal to marginal cost. In this first section, where our slope is getting flatter as quantity increases, this corresponds to a decrease in the slope, right? So our marginal cost is decreasing in this region. Where our slope gets steeper, this corresponds to an increase in the slope, so our marginal cost increases. And actually, we've already gone through the reasons why this happens. So just to restate in terms of marginal cost, Initially, our firm enjoys some benefits of specialization, so the marginal or additional cost of each unit produced decreases. Once we hit our capacity constraints because of our fixed inputs to production, this corresponds to each additional output being more and more expensive to produce. This is diminishing marginal product. There's actually a point, and again, I think my diagrams aren't very good here, but the turning point of the marginal cost curve when it goes from decreasing to increasing corresponds to what we call an inflection point on the total cost curve, where the total cost goes from increasing at a decreasing rate to increasing at an increasing rate. All right, so that's marginal cost. Let's have a look at average variable costs. Average variable cost is variable cost divided by quantity. Now our average variable cost curve will behave in some ways similar to marginal cost for the same reasons. It too will start off higher and it will decrease as we enjoy specialization. It will then come back around again and become positively sloped due to our capacity constraints and our diminishing marginal product. One thing that's important to note is that the marginal cost curve will always intersect the minimum of the average variable cost curve. I'm not going to go through why that's the case here, just because it's already a long video, but I do have another video that explains this very point, and I'll link to that video in the description below if you want to explore that. Our average fixed cost is actually really interesting. We find the average fixed cost by dividing our fixed costs by the quantity that we produce. Remember that our fixed costs are constant. They do not change with quantity. In my example that I had before, fixed costs might be buying the actual restaurant. When quantity is low, fixed costs are going to be very high. So for instance, if my shop cost me $10,000 and I've only made two meals, then my average fixed cost is 10,000 divided by two, which is 5,000. When we increase our output some more, this average is going to fall. For instance, if our output is 100, 
then our average fixed cost is equal to 10,000 divided by 100, which is equal to 100. When our output is 200, my average fixed cost comes out to 50. In fact, our average fixed cost is going to look like the diagram here. So being very high when quantity is very small and it's never going to touch the axes because we can never divide by zero and it will decrease more and more and it will never hit our horizontal axes, but get really, really, really small. So it will always be positive. It will never go to zero or be negative. Now our average total cost is total cost divided by Q and we can actually decompose it into our average fixed plus our average variable costs. Visually, it's going to be pretty high when quantity is low because of those high average fixed costs and it will decrease as average fixed costs and average variable costs decrease. Like our average variable costs, our marginal cost curve will always intersect the minimum of our average total cost curve. It will get pulled up after that point because of that capacity constraint again and those high marginal costs of production. Average total cost is always going to be above average variable costs because recall average total cost is equal to average variable plus average fixed cost. In fact, the difference between them will always just be equal to average fixed costs. And again, my diagram isn't perfect, but I hope you can see the point. So just as average fixed costs gets very, very small for large quantities, so does the difference between average total and average variable costs. And so that's it. I hope that the video helped. If it did, please like and subscribe. Have a lovely day or night.